First part of chapter six of the first volume of the Life of Reason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Fredrik Karlsson. The Life of Reason by George Santayana. Chapter six. Discovery of fellow minds. Side note. Another background for current experience may be found in alien minds. When a ghostly sphere containing memory and all ideas has been distinguished from the material world it tends to grow at the expense of the latter until nature is finally reduced to a mathematical skeleton this skeleton itself but for the need of a bridge to connect calculably episode with episode in experience might be transferred to mind and identified with the scientific thought in which it is represented. But a scientific theory, inhabiting a few scattered moments of life, cannot connect those episodes among which it is itself the last and the least substantial. Nor would such a notion have occurred even to the most reckless skeptic, had the world not possessed another sort of reputed reality, the minds of others, which could serve, even after the supposed extinction of the physical world, to constitute an independent order and to absorb the potentialities of being when immediate consciousness nodded. But other men's minds, being themselves precarious and ineffectual, would never have seemed a possible substitute for nature, to be in her stead the background and intelligible object of experience. Something constant, omnipresent, infinitely fertile is needed to support and connect the given chaos. Just these properties, however, are actually attributed to one of the minds supposed to confront the thinker, namely the mind of God. The divine mind has therefore always constituted in philosophy either the alternative to nature or her other name. It is par excellence the seat of all potentiality and, as Spinoza said, the refuge of all ignorance. Speculative problems would be greatly clarified, and what is genuine in them would be more easily distinguished from what is artificial if we could gather together again the original sources for the belief in separate minds and compare these sources with those we have already assigned to the conception of nature. But speculative problems are not alone concerned, for in all social life we envisage fellow creatures conceived to share the same thoughts and passions and to be similarly affected by events. What is the basis of this conviction? What are the forms it takes? And in what sense is it a part or an expression of reason? this question is difficult, and in broaching it we cannot expect much aid from what philosophers have hitherto said on the subject. For the most part, indeed, they have said nothing, as by nature's kindly disposition most questions which it is beyond a man's power to answer do not occur to him at all. The suggestions which have actually been made in the matter may be reduced to two. First, that we conceive other men's mind by projecting into their bodies those feelings which we immediately perceive to accompany similar operations in ourselves, that is, we infer alien minds by analogy, and second, that we are immediately aware of them and feel them to be friendly or hostile counterparts of our own thinking and effort, that is, we evoke them by dramatic imagination. Side note. Two usual accounts of this conception criticized. Side note. Analogy between bodies. The first suggestion has the advantage that it escapes solipsism by a reasonable argument, provided the existence of the material world has already been granted. But if the material world is called back into the private mind, it is evident that every soul supposed to inhabit it or to be expressed in it must follow it thither 
as inevitably as the characters and forces in an imagined story must remain with it in the inventor's imagination. When, on the contrary, nature is left standing, it is reasonable to suppose that animals having a similar origin and similar physical powers should have similar minds, if any of them was to have a mind at all. The theory, however, is not satisfactory on other grounds. We do not in reality associate our own grimaces with the feelings that accompany them and subsequently on recognizing similar grimaces in another proceed to attribute emotions to him like those we formerly experienced. Our own grimaces are not easily perceived and other men's actions often reveal passions which we have never had, at least with anything like their suggested coloring and intensity. This first view is strangely artificial and mistakes for the natural origin of the belief in question what may be perhaps its ultimate test. Side note, and dramatic dialogue in the soul. The second suggestion, on the other in hand, takes us into a mystic region. That we evoke the felt souls of our fellows by dramatic imagination is doubtless true, but this does not explain how we come to do so, under what stimulus and in what circumstances. Nor does it avoid solipsism, for the felt counterparts of my own will are echoes within me. While if other minds actually exist, they cannot have for their essence to play a game with me in my own fancy. Such society would be mythical, and while the sense for society may well be mythical in its origin, it must acquire some other character, if it is to have practical and moral validity. But practical and moral validity is above all what society seems to have. This second theory, therefore, while its feeling for psychological reality is keener, does not make the recognition of other minds intelligible and leaves our faith in them without justification. Side note. Subject and object empirical, not transcendental terms. In approaching the subject afresh, we should do well to remember that crude experience knows nothing of the distinction between subject and object. This distinction is a division in things, a contrast established between masses of images which show different characteristics in their modes of existence and relation. If this truth is overlooked, if subject and object are made conditions of experience instead of being, like body and mind, its contrasted parts, the revenge of fate, is quick and ironical. Either subject or object must immediately collapse and evaporate altogether. All objects must become modifications of the subject, or all subjects, aspects or fragments of the object. Side note. Objects originally soaked in secondary and tertiary qualities. Now the fact that crude experience is innocent of modern philosophy has this important consequence. That for crude experience all data whatever lie originally side by side in the same field. Extension is passionate, desire moves bodies. Thought broods in space and is constituted by a visible metamorphosis of its subject matter. Animism or mythology is therefore no artifice. Passions naturally reside in the object they agitate. Our own body, if that be the felt seat of some pang, the stars, if the pang can find no nearer resting place. Only a long and still unfinished education has taught men to separate emotions from things and ideas from their objects. This education was needed because crude experience is a chaos and the qualities it jumbles together do not march together in time. Reflection must accordingly separate them, if knowledge, that is, ideas with eventual application and practical transcendence, is to exist at all. In other words, 
action must be adjusted to certain elements of experience and not to others, and those chiefly regarded must have a certain interpretation put upon them by trained apperception. The rest must be treated as moonshine, and taken no account of except perhaps in idle and poetic reverie. In this way crude experience grows reasonable and appearance becomes knowledge of reality. The fundamental reason, then, why we attribute consciousness to natural bodies is that those bodies, before they are conceived to be merely material, are conceived to possess all the qualities which our own consciousness possesses when we behold them. Such a supposition is far from being a paradox, since only this principle justifies us to this day in believing in whatever we may decide to believe in. The qualities attributed to reality must be qualities found in experience, and if we deny their presence in ourselves, for example in the case of omniscience, that is only because the idea of self, like that of matter, has already become special, and the region of ideals, in which omniscience lies, has been formed into a third sphere. But before the idea of self is well constituted, and before the category of ideals has been conceived at all, every ingredient ultimately assigned to those two regions is attracted into the perceptual vortex for which such qualities as pressure and motion supply a nucleus. The moving image is therefore impregnated not only with secondary qualities, color, heat, etc., but with qualities which we may call tertiary, such as pain, fear, joy, malice, feebleness, expectancy. Sometimes these tertiary qualities are attributed to the object in their fullness, and just as they are felt. Thus the sun is not only bright and warm in the same way as he is round, but by the same right he is also happy, arrogant, ever young, and all-seeing. For a suggestion of these tertiary qualities runs through us when we look at him, just as immediately as do his warmth and light. The fact that these imaginative suggestions are not constant does not impede the instant perception that they are actual, and for crude experience, whatever a thing possesses in appearance, it possesses indeed, no matter how soon that quality may be lost again. The moment when they are most adequately manifested and when their inner essence is best revealed. For it is then that they appear in experience most splendidly arrayed and best equipped for their eventual functions. The sun is a better expression of all his ulterior effects when he is conceived to be an arrogant and all-seeing spirit than when he is stupidly felt to be merely hot, so that the attentive and devout observer, to whom those tertiary qualities are revealed, stands in the same relation to an ordinary sensualist, who can feel only the sun's material attributes, as the sensualist in turn stands into one born blind, who cannot add the sun's brightness to its warmth, except by faith in some happier man's reported intuition. The mythologist or poet, before science exists, is accordingly the man of truest and most adequate vision. His persuasion that he knows the heart and soul of things is no fancy reached by artificial inference or analogy, but is a direct report of his own experience and honest contemplation. End of chapter 6, part 1